The story of David and Goliath has been told for thousands of years and is a true underdog story about a young man facing a giant in battle with God delivering him to victory. It's a wonderful story that many have heard even from their youth, but yet this true story has inspired many in all sorts of circumstances to push forward despite how things may appear from a physical standpoint. You think about how it has inspired people in business, for example. When you have a small company, perhaps, being able to, to fight and stay in business despite the, the large businesses that are trying to put it out of business. Or you hear it often when it comes to sports and how certain matchups between very large franchises or very well-run organizations or uh, very well-financed um, teams and programs and such um, and versus programs and teams that are perhaps less so of how this it's a David versus Goliath matchup, sometimes they say. Or in politics, even, you hear these same sorts of um, comparisons being made of how someone who pulls off an, an upset victory in politics talking about how David it's like David defeating Goliath, or certainly in war as well. And you think about just how many times this story has inspired people to push forward no matter how things appear from a physical perspective. But even more serious than these applications, this story is relevant on a spiritual level as you think about how the devil tries to use giants to, to defeat all of us. And we'll talk more about that as we go through uh, this particular lesson, and I'll encourage you to think about the particular kinds of giants that the devil uses to try to defeat you. So as we each face our giants, we can follow the blueprint that David has left us. And so, as we go throughout this series, I want us to do exactly that. Now, in this first lesson, we're going to kind of overview things, but yet, and then we'll go through the story piece by piece to see the different individual parts that resulted in David defeating Goliath and try to make the applications for us today of how it is that we can defeat our giants. The purpose of this lesson is to learn that giants challenge people today by overviewing the story of David and Goliath and considering the reality of facing giants today. Let's begin by thinking about the story itself of David and Goliath. And let's start with a little bit of the context. Now, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to read through that chapter as we go through uh, this particular study. But the story itself finds itself in a very specific context. And if you back up a few chapters, you'll be able to see that. And then um, you could even broaden that out even more. The battle between David and Goliath occurred as part of a conflict between the Israelites, who of course were God's chosen people in the Old Testament, and the Philistines. Now this occurred during the time that King Saul was king in Israel. This was a time that we often refer to as the United Kingdom. It's when all of God's people, the Israelites, were united as one kingdom under one uh, king. At this time, this was the first of those kings, and so this was the time that Saul was king in Israel. However, two chapters prior to the battle, you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 15, and it records King Saul's disobedience to God. And it records how God rejected Saul's family as heirs to the throne because of his disobedience, that there would be another who would be chosen as king after Saul. It would not pass on to Saul's son. Instead, the prophet Samuel was sent to Jesse's house to appoint the next one or to anoint the next one who would be the next king, and that was David. Well, after this, we come into 1 Samuel chapter 16, and it records how Saul would be tormented. And David was the one who was chosen to play the lyre, a harp-like uh, instrument, and make him feel better. 
I want you to notice how David was described in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 18. One of the young men answered, he said, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is also a valiant man, a warrior, eloquent, handsome, and the Lord is with him. So even from this early time that King Saul is hearing about this man named David, this young man named David, that he is described in these ways, and he is described as a valiant man and a warrior. We don't have a lot of details about any of that, but we do see him being described in this way. Well, Saul loved David, and David became Saul's armor bearer, even in 1 Samuel 16 and in verse 22. But then we come into 1 Samuel 17, and it introduces us to the battle itself between the Philistines and the Israelites. And we see the, um, the context of that particular um, battle. The Philistines gathered their forces for war at Soka in Judah and camped between Soka and Azekah and Aphus Damim. Saul and the men of Israel gathered and camped in the valley of Elah. Then they lined up in battle formation to face the Philistines. Now, this was not the first time these two nations had clashed. In fact, we see them frequently uh, clashing in the Old Testament. The Philistines were a powerful and wealthy nation that seemed to provide regular challenges to the Israelite nation. Well, now they're prepared to fight again. Now, we don't know why. But they were prepared to fight again. And we also see that there's some context here as far as the Israelites failing to drive out um, the people when they came into the land of Canaan. And now we've got this, this problem. So there's many things we could think about regarding the context itself. But here they are, and they're ready to fight. We're not given the details as why they're ready to fight. Uh, but here we are. Now, let's take some time to work on sizing up the giant. Let's read 1 Samuel 17, verses 3 through 7. The Philistines were standing on one hill, and the Israelites were standing on another hill with a ravine between them. Then a champion named Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. He was nine feet, nine inches tall and wore a bronze helmet and bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was bronze armor on his shins, and a, uh, and a bronze javelin was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver's beam, and the iron point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield-bearer was walking in front of him. So, as the two nations are lined up in battle formation on opposite, uh, on opposing hilltops, a ravine in between, their champion warrior emerges. Now, just as a note, consider that the word champion here um, referred to one who would go out in front of the army and who would fight between two armies. So we were, as we're going to see, as we keep going, we're going to see that um, Goliath would be the one who would go and fight in this space between the two armies, and then one from the Israelites would also come forth and fight. The Hebrew text records this one as being a giant. Now, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and the Dead Sea Scrolls has, giant, has Goliath as only being around six foot, six inches tall. Still a tall man, but not what we would think of as a giant. The literal Hebrew measurement says that Goliath was six cubits in a span. Now, a cubit um, was approximately the, the length from... Um, an individual's elbow to the tip of his finger, about 18 inches. And then a span was the distance from a person's thumb to his 
um, his pinky on his outstretched hand, about nine inches. And so from that, then, we can correlate that he was approximately, as this translation does, nine feet, nine inches tall. Just take a moment and put that into perspective. I often think about a regulation basketball hoop that is 10 foot tall. And then he also had substantial armor that's pictured here. It's not just that he is a giant, but he has substantial armor, including a bronze helmet and a bronze scale armor. Now, his, his scale armor or coat of mail weighed approximately 125 pounds, just his armor. Um, you think about how strong he would have to be to be able to carry armor and operate effectively in armor that is 125 pounds. And then he had bronze armor on his shins and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. And the shaft for his spear was like a weaver's beam, this long pole. We're not told the length, but certainly you think about this, um, this massive shaft of the, the, um, for his spear. And the point of the spear was made of iron and weighed approximately 15 pounds itself. Later, we also learn that he had a sword in verse 51. And plus, Goliath has a shield bearer who walked in front of him. So I want you to just really think about this description and take a moment to view Goliath from across the ravine. I want you to imagine that you are an Israelite soldier who sees this man emerge from the Philistine camp. Now we get the challenge being offered. We want to read 1 Samuel 17 verses 8 through 11. It says, he stood and shouted to the Israelite battle formations, why do you come out to line up in battle formation? He asked, he asked them, am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose one of your men and have him come down against me. If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. But the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so we can fight each other. When Saul and all Israel heard these words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. So here's God's people being challenged by this giant to select one of their soldiers to fight with him one-on-one. Whoever would lose would result in his nation serving the winning nation. Now, this kind of warfare can be referred to as single combat, where representatives from the warring nations would fight and avoid a larger conflict. And in many ways, these conflicts, these battles, would often be viewed as being battles decided by the gods, the gods of one nation versus the gods of another. And then this passage describes the reaction of the Israelites. They hear this challenge, they see this man, and they lose their courage and are terrified. Again, put yourself on the Israelite side of the mountain, of the hill, and, and think about how you would respond. Well, next we find that David arrives at the battle as we read now in 1 Samuel 17, verses 12 through 30. It says, Now David was the son of the uh, Ephrathite from Bethlehem of Judah named Jesse. Jesse had eight sons and during Saul's reign was already an old man. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war and their names were Eliab, the firstborn, Abinadab, the next, and Shammah, the third. And David was the youngest. The three oldest had followed Saul but David kept going back and forth from Saul to tend to his father's flock in Bethlehem. Every morning and evening for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand. One day, Jesse had told his son David, Take this half bushel of roasted grain along with these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Also, take these ten portions of cheese to the field commander. Check on the well-being of your brothers 
and bring a confirmation from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David got up early in the morning, left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was marching out to its battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle formation facing each other. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and ran to the battle line. When he arrived, he asked his brothers how they were. While he was speaking with them, suddenly the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words, which David heard. When all the Israelite men saw Goliath, they retreated from him terrified. Previously, an Israelite man had declared, Do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the family of that man's daughter or that man's uh, father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. David spoke to the men who were standing with him. What will be done for the man who kills that Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The troops told him about the offer, concluding that that is what will be done for the man who kills him. David's oldest brother Eliab listened as he spoke to the men, and he became angry with him. Why did you come down here? he asked. Why did you leave those few sheep? Uh, who did you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your arrogance and your evil heart. You came down to see the battle. What have I done now? protested David. It was just a question. Then he turned from those beside him to others in front of him and asked about the offer. The people gave him the same answer as before. So, in addition to being King Saul's shield bearer and servant, David also evidently tended to his father's flock at times. Well, David's father, Jesse, sent David to the battle with some provisions for his three oldest brothers who were with King Saul at the battle to see how they were doing. Now, when he arrived, David saw the Israelite army march to its battle formation. He heard them shout their battle cry, and he heard Goliath shout his usual challenge, and he saw the Israelites retreat from Goliath out of terror. When he saw this, and then he heard about King Saul's offered reward, that is, to, to make him rich, to give his um, daughter to him, and making his family tax-exempt, David was interested. So then, as we continue reading through the story, we find out that David agrees to fight. Let's read in uh, 1 Samuel 17. Let's read now verses 31 through 37. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. So he had David brought to him. David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. But Saul replied, You can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth, and he's been a warrior since he was young. David answered Saul, Your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. So, while every other Israelite soldier was terrified, David volunteered, and he told everyone not to be discouraged. 
Even when King Saul told David he was just a youth and you can't go fight Goliath, David demonstrated that he had killed lions and he had killed bears in his work as a shepherd and he would defeat this uncircumcised Philistine who had defied the armies of the living God. Finally, we see King Saul allow David to fight. Yet I want you to notice that David's confidence was not in himself, but in God's ability to save, as God had delivered him in the past. David simply saw the challenge for what it really was. He saw it as a challenge against God. And David could not stand idly by and watch this Philistine defy the armies of the living God. So moving on from this point then, we see that David then prepares for battle. Let's read in 1 Samuel 17, verses 38 through 40. Then Saul had his own military clothes put on David. He put a bronze helmet on David's head and had him put on armor. David strapped his sword on over the military clothes and tried to walk, but he was not used to them. I can't walk in these, David said to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off. Instead, he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag. Then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. So David was unable to use the armor that King Saul offered him. This included a bronze helmet and a sword. For David couldn't walk in them properly and was not used to them. Remember that King Saul was a larger man himself. 1 Samuel 9 and verse 2 talks about him being a head, head of, uh, taller than the rest of the people of Israel. So these didn't fit David. He wasn't used to them, and so he wasn't going to be able to use this armor that was offered to him. But rather than give up, David armed himself in another way. David took his shepherd's staff, five smooth stones, and a sling to the battle against Goliath. And then as we keep reading, now in verses 41 through 58, we find the the end of the story, so to speak, that David defeats Goliath. Starting in verse 41, then the Philistine came closer and closer to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a youth, healthy and handsome. He said to David, am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? Then he cursed David by his gods. Come here, the Philistine called to David, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today the Lord will hand you over to me. Today I'll strike you down, remove your head, and give give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God, and this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. When the Philistines started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in the bag, took out a stone, slung it, and hit the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. David overpowered the Philistine and killed him without having a sword. David ran and stood over him. He grabbed the Philistine's sword, pulled it from its sheath, and used it to kill him. Then he cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and Judah Judah rallied, shouting their battle cry, and chased the Philistines to the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. Philistine bodies were strewn all along the Shereim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from the pursuit of the Philistines, they plundered their camps 
David took Goliath's head and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put Goliath's weapon, weapons on, in his own tent. When Saul had seen David going out to confront the Philistine, he asked Abner, the commander of the army, Whose son is this youth, Abner? Your majesty, as surely as, I, as you live, I don't know, Abner replied. The king replied, Find out whose son this young man is. When David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the Philistine's head still in his hand. Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? The son of your servant, Jesse of Bethlehem, David answered. So as David ran into battle, he looked ill-equipped to win from a physical perspective. Even though he was a valiant man and a warrior, as we saw back in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 18, he was a youth and under-armored from a military perspective, going up against a heavily armored giant experienced in this kind of warfare. Yet David recognized this battle was not really about David versus Goliath. He recognized this battle really isn't even about the Israelites versus the Philistines. Instead, David recognized the true battle was between Goliath's gods and the true living God. So the victory would not be by David's strength, but by God's strength. And David knew that the true God was infinitely stronger and bigger than the Philistine and all his gods. So, against all physical odds, David defeated Goliath, slinging a stone toward and hitting the Philistine on the forehead. And then, when the giant had fallen, David finished him off with the giant's own sword, cutting off his head. And the Israelites then pursued and plundered the Philistines. So, that's a quick overview of the story as we read it there in 1 Samuel chapter 17. But before we close this lesson, let's take a little bit of time and, uh, and think about how we are to face our giants today. Let's begin with understanding that you are at war. You know, before you look at the giants you face, you must recognize the war that you're fighting. Whether you choose to fight or not, you are at war. We are all at war. And this is a spiritual war for your soul. 1 Peter 2 verse 11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. And therefore, this is the greatest of all wars. This is a war not just with physical and life and death implications. This is a war with eternal, spiritual implications. If the enemy uses his giants to defeat you, then you become a slave, and you will experience eternal, spiritual death. But if you defeat the giants and the enemy, you will experience eternal life. You can see that in Romans, 5, verses, or Romans 6, verses 15 through 23. Now, the enemy you face in this war is Satan, it's the devil, who is the leader of all rebellion against God. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9 says, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. He is your enemy, and he is my enemy. And the war is made up of a lifelong series of battles between the flesh and the spirit. Satan is trying to appeal to your desires of the flesh so that you fulfill your own desires rather than obey God. He wants you to be short-sighted. He wants you to do whatever pleases yourself now not thinking about what will happen to your spirit when your life is over and Jesus returns. We're warned about this in Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. It says, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, 
he will also reap, because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So you are at war, and you need to recognize that. But then as you recognize the broader war that's going on, you also need to recognize that Satan uses giants to defeat you. The enemy in 1 Samuel 17 was the Philistines. Yet as part of their strategy to defeat the Israelites, they wanted to fight a single combat battle with their champion, Goliath, as we have described him looking at 1 Samuel 17. Through this, they wanted to capture the entire nation of Israel. Today, although Satan has many military strategies he's using to attack you and to attack me, we must not be ignorant of how he tries to use giants to defeat you and me. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11 talks about um, that we might not be taken advantage of by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. He has military, spiritual strategies and schemes that he's employing to try to defeat us. Now, both Scripture and your own experiences and observations should help you see that Satan uses giants to fight against you. Now, by this term giants, I don't mean a physical giant like Goliath. Instead, I am distinguishing between the various temptations that we all face every single day and the major sources of struggles that you face and that I face. Those are our giants. Your giants attack areas in which Satan knows you are particularly vulnerable. So while other temptations may quickly come and go, now we shouldn't dismiss them, but we might be more easily able to resist them, your giants are often a much greater challenge. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Satan continues to show these giants to you, and they will threaten whether you will serve God or whether you will serve Satan. Now, before we close, I want to take just a few moments just to identify some common giants. Every person on this earth faces giants, and Satan knows which giants are most effective against which people. Consider some examples of giants that Satan uses against people today. It can be depression, anxiety, fear, discouragement, insecurity, persecution, discomfort, or comfort, apathy, pride, anger, lust, guilt, shame, something in your past, tobacco, alcohol, drugs, dishonesty, codependency, sex, money, worldly possessions, success, work, idols, busyness, worldly interests and hobbies, death, worry, peer pressure. The list of giants can go on and on and on and on. But you need to evaluate for yourself. Which giants does Satan use against you? And be honest with yourself so as to identify your giants and to size them up. Just like David Saul Goliath. He had that opportunity to size up Goliath. Know what you're up against and know how each giant is challenging you. And then I encourage you as you take time today to consider what giant or giants you are facing. Identify them and then continue through this Bible study series as we're going to continue to Walk through this story of David and Goliath and learn piece by piece how was it that David defeated Goliath. And we're going to use that as a model to help us learn how to defeat our giants today. Well, as we close, giants challenge people today. No doubt about it. The Philistines used Goliath to challenge the Israelites. 
Today, Satan is trying to defeat you spiritually and make you his slave. He is using giants to help him accomplish this goal. But you can defeat your giants just as David defeated Goliath.